Hey everyone, thank you so much today for joining me. My name is Abu Dukuri and uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started quickly. Uh, first up, I just uh, wanted to know if you can hear me properly, if you can see everything okay. Um, yep. Yes. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, appreciate your time today and uh, we're gonna talk about the basics of touch technology. We have a few dozen people here on the webinar side and uh, um, I'm gonna go ahead and go through. So my name is Ab Utukuri. I'm the founder and CEO here at Panto. And my background, I am an engineer by trade. Um, I've been involved in interactive touch technologies for almost a dozen years or so, uh, going back to uh, when the iPhone was originally launched. Um, I've worked on the software side of things, hardware side of things. Um, my, me and my team have over 100 patents in this space. And uh, I'm really, today, my objectives are, a lot of you know about touch and interactive technology. So I wanted to dive deep in. We've been using this for a dozen or so years. And I really want to touch on the basics of different types of touch technologies. Uh, we want to really talk about the pros and cons of various technologies. And really, this is the big one. What is the, understand the user experience and how do you maximize it? Because if you don't understand how the technology works and how it can be optimized, you actually are leaving a lot of value on the table. And over years and years of experienced bad installations, good ideas, poor implementations. And I want to talk, kind of talk about that today. So that would be my goals today. So I want to talk about a few house rules. Um, let's actually, this is a very different type of webinar. First up, this is not pre recorded, this is completely live. So the opportunity to engage is fundamentally different because all of us have been on a lot of different webinars in the past. So first off, hey, if you want to go turn on your videos, let's actually network. If you turn on your video, we actually promote you into a co-host and you actually can interact with each other. So let's make it feel like we're meeting each other at a networking event versus being passive. Second up, if you want to have a question, you want to, uh, you want to go ahead and uh, uh, participate, go for it. Unmute yourself, have a conversation, raise your hand. Again, this is a live event. I want to create an experience where people are actually uh, getting value out of it. Thank you so much. Uh, have fun, share, comment, participate. This is also being live broadcast into LinkedIn and a couple of forums. So we can't interact with everyone, but whoever actually joining with video, we can interact with. Um, first up, I'd love to see on the chat, what is, uh, uh, where's everybody uh, joining us from today? You wanna just put up some messages on chat? So I'm actually calling you from Toronto, Canada. Let me move my chat window over. Oh, sorry about that. Should have set that up earlier. Mississauga, Detroit, Atlanta. Awesome, so people are coming in from all neck of the woods here today, which is indicative of our pandemic uh, webinars these days. And I'm gonna start off with a basic question here. A lot of you probably are in the interactive touchscreen type space. And first question is, does interactive touch tech have value? So we are in the business of selling all sorts of cool solutions that are out there. We've been locked up for two years in a pandemic. Has anybody run to their offices or their boardrooms going, oh my God, I miss my huge display AV installation that we put hundreds of thousands of dollars into because if I don't have access to it, I can't get my job done. Anybody? Or did we all get along without any of that stuff? <laughs> BJ, absolutely. You're missing your hundreds of thousands of dollars in, the, in value. So that's the kind of ugly truth is, is we are in the business of selling some really cool stuff, but most customers use them as glorified TV scrapes. I think the number of people who said the CEO is going to watch the football game on it. Like, I mean, <laughs> we've heard that before. Or, hey, I actually want to put all of this technology in so I can click one button to join a meeting. Really? Like, that's the best value we're going to get. And obviously, I've seen enough of these systems collect dust. And what actually happens is, is when this happens, it's very difficult for us to 
introduce more products. It's difficult for us to expand these products in the environment. And the funny thing is, is interactive touch is not just you know, a, 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 a shiny pebble because we have some amazing technology that sold billions of that we can't live with. So something is definitely missing. Um, and I wanna actually talk about what is holding all of this back. Is it the user experience? Is it use case? Is it, do we really understand our users? That's the type of stuff that I want to uncover today. Because if we don't understand what the value is other than watching the football game, because that's the cool thing that they wanna do, it's very difficult to design solutions and implement them into businesses all over the world and expand this market. Because for 10 years, I've been hearing about the evolution of how interactive technologies are gonna take over. And so far, it's always been disappointing. So first step, what I'm gonna do is, I'm actually gonna go back to the basics and kind of teach about how different touch technologies work. And we're gonna use some of that knowledge to understand how experiences are gonna be built up and what are the most important attributes. These are predominantly the biggest uh, technologies. Resist is one of the first technologies out into the market. That's been around since the 1960s in some shape or form. Capacitive is something that you are very familiar with. PCAP is what's in our phones and, and lots of desktop monitors, lots of uh, advantages. This got really innovated in the 1980s and 1990s. Infrared is newer to the market. It came out in the 2000s. So, and then ShadowSense is a technology I'm gonna talk about. That came out only about, about six, seven years ago. And they all have different advantages and disadvantages. And a lot of times people don't even know what they need to go ahead and pick. And I'm gonna talk about that today. And of course, anytime you have a question, you know, put up a, put up a chat message, uh, put up your hand, I'd love to go ahead and interact. So let's talk about the oldest technology first, resistive. So the way that resistive technology works is really, really simple. They take two sheets of plastic, and on that plastic, you've got wires. On one sheet, the wires are going in this direction. On the other sheet, the wires are going in the other direction. And when you push on that sheet of plastic, you basically force the two wires to go ahead and connect. You're short-circuiting it. And based on short-circuiting the location, you actually can go ahead and determine that. And that's why these are called four-wire resistive controllers because there really is a wire along the top, wire along the bottom, along the side, along the side. And you're basically going, there's a short from here to here, and there's a short from here to here. So it must have been right there. It's really, really simple. It's like a keypad. And what they do is when you have the two sheets of plastic, you've got to separate them. So they use these little spacers or little dots now, when you go to the Hertz uh, or you go to a Marriott hotel and you're signing on a digital signature pad, actually the UPS pads are quite common. They're all resist. You'll actually see white dots along the plastic. That's the common giveaway that that's a resistive technology. So they have two layers. Sometimes it's glass, sometimes it's a PET plastic. They use something called indium tin oxide, which is a a transparent semiconductor because you don't want to have show wires because if you show wires, it looks really horrible. And that's what they do. All they do is they read the top bar, the side bar, and using four wires, they determine where you're going ahead and touching. And it has some definitely advantages. It's very low cost. It's, as I told you, it's been around since the 50s and 60s, early touchscreens coming back to, remember those old CRT touchscreens that we used to have in the 1980s? That was all resist. It's completely ob object agnostic. You can touch with any object, fingernail, and there's no bezel. It also, because it's a physical plastic, touching a physical plastic, it's immune to a lot of radiation. It's immune to a whole bunch of things. But there's some problems. First of all, it requires a lot of pressure. So these plastic sheets can also wear out. And as they wear out, if you've ever looked at those UPS like signature pads and all that, they become very cloudy by nature. And that's the challenge that you have. They don't look good. They wear out quickly. Also, because it's two plastic sheets, dust can easily get in the middle. You'll never stop dust from getting inside this plastic sheet, which means that you have contaminant problem. Um, these also don't scale to small sizes. There's a lot of performance issues. So it's really useful for a very small segment of the market 
where you have tiny screens, poor performance, you don't care about how hard you have to push. Um, it's almost like a disposable technology these days. So that's the pros and cons. Now, a lot of people have heard about PCAP or projected capacitive, and you might wonder how our phone actually works. Most of the predominant, I'd say 99% of touchscreens out there are actually PCAP. That is the dominant technology. And it's very similar to resist in that you're shorting two different wires, but what they do is again, they use indium tin oxide, the same transparent semiconductor. And what they have is they have pads that are arranged in alternating patterns. And what actually happens is, is this pad is positively charged, this pad is negatively charged. So the electrical current is moving from this pad to this pad. It, think about it like magnets, okay? If I put small magnets down, and we've all done this as kids and we put a piece of paper on it, what do you get? You get iron filings that show you the magnetic path. But very similarly, you actually have an electrical current that is moving from one electrode to the other electrode. And when you touch with your finger, you absorb that electrical current. That's why it's called projected capacitance. It's projecting a field above the glass. And when I physically hover or touch on that field, my body absorbs. And when my body absorbs it, the signal decreases. So I know that the signal between this and this pad went down and the signal between this pad and went down, et cetera. So I know that the touch was localized in that area. So that's is pretty well how this technology works. And there's some interesting pros and cons for this as well. Again, because of massive volume, I mean, maybe 20 years ago, you needed tens of millions of dollars to invest into PCAP technologies, sputtering machines, all that type of stuff. All that is gone. It's much cheaper these days. There is no bezel. That's why your phone is completely flat. It's got no bezel at all. Um, it processes multi-touch. There's no pressure. It's a really long life. There's some great reliability there. Um, as you know, you could have liquid on the phone. Your, finger, your phone still works. But there are some big challenges. One of them is going to be EMI interference. So remember, when I come back to this drive electronic from here to here, I actually have an electrical current set up. But if there's a microwave or something like a motor close by that's generating a lot of noise, my finger is not going to absorb that charge really well. So as soon as there's an EMI field, your PCAP screens don't work very well at all. And you also won't work if it's a gloved finger because my glove is not necessarily an absorber of the electrical current, it's an insulator. So I can't touch it with a stylus, I can't touch it with a stick, I can't use all sorts of non-conductive material do not work with PCAP. There's also an optical clarity problem because in order to get a really good PCAP screen, I have to cover the screen with these transparent semiconductors and they're never truly transparent. So what they do is they try to put more of a backlight on, they try to make the display brighter, but there's always, even if you take your iPhone and look at it, look at it sometimes there's a rainbow shimmer on it. And that rainbow shimmer can make it be difficult to use it in a variety of different applications, optical clarity, limited scalability, like you cannot get PCAP to work on a massive LED video wall, as an example. Because the longer these wires are, the more difficult it is for them to conduct electricity. Resistance takes over. So what happens is, is once you get to 55, 65, the performance of PCAP starts falling off relatively quickly. I've seen, don't get me wrong, I've seen some 75, 85, even 98 inch PCAP, crazy expensive, but performance is, um, is not necessarily ideal. You'll get a lot of false touches. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So those are some of the big challenges that you have with PCAP. Again, that's why this tech is ideally suited for consumer electronic devices that are very small and it's portable, it's mobile, where you're always touching with your, with your finger. I would never be able to pick up an eraser like this and just erase on a PCAP screen. Those are some of the type of things that you cannot do. So then you get to IR touch. Now we're moving into around the 2000s. And in 2000s, 
you know, lots of LED diodes came out. Back before this, anything that actually emitted light was really big. It was too expensive, too cumbersome. But about 20 years ago, LEDs became incredibly popular and low cost. And what they actually have is this is a classic, you know, James Bond laser grid, right? Remember all those, uh, Dr. No will have all the lasers and you have to actually avoid them. So that's what you got. You got a whole bunch of LEDs that are firing beams of light. And when I put my finger down on it, I'm actually blocking a specific set of beams. And when I block those beams, what actually happens is my system will go, there's a zero here, there's a zero here, one, 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 one. And I know the location so I can very quickly figure out where I'm touching, where I'm not. So there's some pretty simple advantages to this. This is not like a PCAP where the sensing is done at the glass level. This is not, so these are called, these are basically films. PCAP touch and resist are really film, whereas the IR touch is an overlay because all the electronics are at the edge. It does not care what's actually on the glass. So great, great advantages, optical, you know, clarity. There's nothing on the glass. There's no film. True multi-touch as well. A lot of them have amazing multi-touch performance. They're completely scalable. They, I've seen IR systems go two, three, 400 inches because all it is is put a more powerful LED. The more powerful LED you have, the more distance it'll go, the more distance it'll go, the bigger size you can do. There's no pressure. And because all of this is just lights that are blinking on and off, there's no EMI. You can put this into medical systems. You can put this into uh, a variety of different situations where a normal EMI would kill you. Like, for example, uh, equipment that has a lot of motors. If you have a motor that's turning on or off, you might get a big EMI. Same thing with control rooms or even big AV equipment installs. If I'm going to a boardroom and I have a huge LED wall with all sorts of power supplies and Crestron controllers and you have noisy power, capacitive touch can be really problematical, but IR will not. So what's the, what's the challenges with it? Well, first of all, you have a bezel. And what I mean by that is you always have a mechanical protrusion. It'll never be truly flat. Because of the fact that infrared lights are above the glass, you are going to have a mechanical bezel. They actually have a lot of problems with ambient light. So if I go back to this LED drawing right here, I'm gonna pick that up. I could actually have an LED here. Now my finger blocked it and I have my receiver right here. But what if I have the sunlight? The sunlight comes in and floods the receiver. It has no idea. So that's kind of like saying, I turned, my, my camera has a flash. I turned the flash off, but then I opened up the window. So the flash really doesn't make a difference. So this LED doesn't make a difference when the sun comes out. So that's why a lot of the LED touchscreens do not work well in ambient light. And I've gone to dozens of trade shows where people put touchscreens and they have an overhang on top of their booth. They'll actually have the touchscreen in a darker area. And that's because the trade show lights can go ahead and kill it. People have struggles with boardrooms that have windows. They open the windows up. Suddenly, the touchscreen doesn't work. Now, they've made improvements to this. But unfortunately, the fundamental technology as to how IR touchscreens work, they lack ambient light and they also lack resolution. Because if you think about resolution here, if I want to detect between here and here in the middle, I actually need to have more beams. The only way I can get more resolution is add more beams. That means more LEDs, that means more cost. So they are very resolution dependent. And what happens with a lot of the IR touchscreens is, yeah, you can get some digital time touch touchscreens that are really low cost. Guess what? You don't get the performance. You don't get the ability to write. They have poor latency. They actually operate really slowly because every one of these LEDs has to be turned on. They got to measure whether it's blocked or not. Then they actually have to go ahead and write down these ones or zeros. So they definitely have a variety of issues and they, get to, they need to be calibrated as well. So IR has those issues. And now we come to a unique technology called ShadowSense, which I was uh, one of the, uh, the, the co-inventors of at Banto. And the way that ShadowSense works, it's, it's actually a unique shadow sensor. 
And what that does is it's like an electronic sundial. So let me give you an example. If you have a sundial and I know the height and the width of this particular sundial, you can actually calculate out this angle theta. And based on that angle, I can determine a vector. So if I have two sundials and they both give me the shadow, guess what? This and this will allow me to calculate this x, y position. So if anybody wants to derive the simple geometry here, I'm, uh, I'm all open to it. Uh, it'll take some grade six, grade seven geometry, um, but uh, there's some signs no, and you. cosines involved. <laughs> but it's actually relatively straightforward. All we do is you measure. So the way that the shadow sensor actually works is we have two pixels side by side. And I call this my, my backyard patio. So let's actually label this thing. This is, this is the garden, okay? And this is the patio, and this is the awning, right? And at high noon, all the light falls on my garden, but my awning blocks half the light on the patio. But as the sun is setting, you get more and more light on the patio. And as the sun is rising, you get less light. So it's like you wake up and you look outside and you can tell where the shadow is. And based on that shadow, you'd be able to tell what time it is. Because I know in morning there's no shadow, in evening there's full. So I can very quickly determine what time it is. But also what's interesting is, is I can also tell the weather. I can determine if it's a bright and sunny day or if it's a very gloomy uh, overcast day because the shadow is gonna be darker or the shadow is gonna be lighter. So what happens is, is the interference of these shadows. So if I can now figure out these shadows, from various angles and various locations, all we do is we intersect them. And when you intersect these shadows, you actually get the location. So a very good analogy for this is, imagine that uh, you have a car that's parking lot full of cars and their headlights. And there's a telephone pole right there. If all these cars turned on their headlights, you would get a spider web of shadows. By looking at the intersection of the spider web, you actually determine the size. I can tell you if it's a big telephone pole. I can tell you if it's a small telephone pole. We could also determine if that telephone pole is made of wood or metal or transparent plastic because the shadow will be duller. So the darkness of the shadow combined with the size and the shape of the shadow gives us position, size, transparency, there's a whole bunch of capabilities that this actually has. So pros and cons of shadow sense, like again, multi-touch optical carry, it's very similar to IR. It has all the advantages of IR, EMI capability, huge scales, but it also is way faster. Because we're only measuring, remember on the IR system here, we're actually measuring hundreds and hundreds of beams. Well, in the shadow sense system, we're only measuring six shadows. So inherently, the system is way faster. It is much more responsive. And because it can determine the size and the shape of the object, you can do cool things like saying, this is, this is a whiteboard that I'm writing on with a pen. There's no battery in here. Or I pick up an eraser and I suddenly can erase. Or it actually knows this is my finger which leads to some very unique user experiences. Because again, if you ever have a, anybody here have a PCAP pen for their Dell laptop or their Microsoft laptop, you know those pens are super expensive. They're like two, $300. They use this crazy end size battery to make it tiny. If you ever tried to buy those batteries, they're like 32 bucks on Amazon, go ahead and take a look. And if you break that pen, you're toast, right? It is not a great boardroom solution. This is a piece of plastic with no charging, Nothing, it just determines the size and shape. So what the unique thing is, is now these are some of the disadvantages. You do have to have a mechanical bezel. It'll never be truly flat. We can make it small, but you need space for that. And we do have a higher power requirement. So those are some of the disadvantages of shadow sense as to, as to the material. But from a reliability point of view, um, it's quite interesting, which I'm gonna talk about later. So first up, every 
installation I've ever done in the last 10 years. I come in and I go, hey, Mr. Customer, what's your objective with your video wall, with your interactive touch technology? And this is the picture that's haunted me for 10 years. Have you ever seen Minority Report app where the guy comes in and puts up all this content and moves around? We want to do that. <laughs> and the number of times I look at it going, okay, why do you want to do that? Who's going to do it? Where are you doing it from? What's the workflow like? What do we get? Blank stares. <laughs> but I want to go ahead and do this, right? So I don't know if that movie was a service to the industry or a disservice to the industry, but it's hilarious that 20 years later, people are still talking about it. And I'm going to ask a very quick question here. Are we delivering on this promise? And if anybody's there on chat uh, on the webinar side and also the co-host side, go ahead and tell me, you know, do you think that anybody is delivering on this promise? Well, I can speak from the, that perspective, just the, this is Jamie Finnegan from Media Resources. We obviously were in contact with a lot of the dealers that resell this technology to their clients. Yeah. And for the most part, if you ask, if you were to pull 100 AV integrators and said, hey, of the last 100 installs that you did that involved interactivity, uh, what's the level of use or what's what's the inclusion of workflow that goes on currently? And they would tell you little to none, little to none is actually taking place in terms of and and really it's one of those things where people thought they wanted to have it thought they were supposed to have it you know got got the technology put in their hands and realized that it's going to take a learning curve that they weren't prepared for and thus it just fizzles off into the sunset and there you go so there you go and for companies like yourself and us Jamie for all of the effort that we put into invent all this stuff it's very disheartening to see that they never even turned it on yeah, but 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 the interesting thing though is it's still being the demand is still there. So still there. even though even though there's a lot of uh, you know uh, a lot of clients and users that are disillusioned from interactivity being part of what they've deployed, there's still a big demand for it. We're getting asked for it all the time. I mean that's part of the reason why we're you know looking to partner. Or we're partnering with you guys, as you know, is is the you know our tech our display technology uh, can embrace touch you know in the dv led space but right. separate from just the separate from the dv led side of it just from the overall demand perspective it's still high it's still people are still asking for it so absolutely so it's it's more important now than ever before to bring forward a technology and an experience that allows them to embrace it instead of running from it so if you actually came up and delivered on this vision i can't even imagine what would happen to the market then <laughs> So Agreed. people are Agreed. actually asking for this, not delivering, and the number of installations where they've actually even stopped turning the display on, it's unbelievable, right? So obviously there's a lot of mistake. Now, people ask me this all the time. Hey, um, Ab, you know, I don't know if we need interactive touch technologies or AV technologies because we're all going to go into the metaverse. What do you think about that? So I have a joke that I want to say that here's my biggest nightmare. We all buy $10,000 worth of headsets and laptops and upgrade our whole thing and create digital avatars. And we join our first metaverse meeting. And what they do is they go full screen on a PowerPoint and trap me in a 60 foot PowerPoint slide for the next one and a half hours, right? Like, come on, seriously, we're all gonna jump in. And Jamie, are you gonna be a, the pink panda with the, with the blue hair? And I'm gonna show up as, as you know, I'm gonna put that leather jacket on and like with, with a gr green tail coming off of me. And then what's the workflow? The workflow is, hey, Jamie, I'm gonna go full screen on my PowerPoint deck and I'm gonna trap you now, right? Where you're not, or I'm gonna completely take over your sensory information. And no, that's not the answer for me, right? The answer is display technologies. And you know, the most, and a, a good friend of mine who's a, a famous author, she goes, ah, VR was invented thousands of years ago. You know what the best VR device is? A good book. <laughs> you know? And I always took that to heart because actually you're right. A damn good book transports you into places. Uh, I, actually, my wife has gone to places that we've read about and then gone there and going, the book was better. <laughs> so so the, the reality is, is that's not, the answer to a lot of our corporate you know, interactions. We still wanna to talk to people. We want to interface with each other 
Uh, we want to connect with individuals. And there's a lot of challenges because at the end of the day, this digital technology in my, in my pocket still is one of the most connective elements of my life or else we wouldn't be married to it. And if we can figure out what the use case and what the right way to apply the audiovisual technologies into, into our boardrooms and our conference rooms is, you actually have a massive opportunity that's been untapped. And as Jamie said, the interest is there, even though people are not necessarily getting value out of it, what would happen if you actually got value out of it? So let's actually talk about that. So traditionally, this is where most of us have focused, which is coming back to this guy over here, I want to take any type of data from everywhere and put it up anyhow that I want it, no matter who's there. It's just a crazy idea, right? So what we end up doing is we end up focusing on the executive boardrooms. We focus on these complex collaboration sessions where architects and engineers and all sorts of crazy people are putting data together. That's the vision. And what happens is, is most of the time the architects and engineers say, cool idea, but you know what? We don't work like that. We have this CAD system together with this system, together with that system, and we export it this way, and then we share it that way, and it's in our portal this way. And can your video wall do all of those things? It's like, actually, no, we, our video wall is not an AutoCAD workstation, you know, together with your LMS system and your repository. It's just a screen. So then they go, well, then I can't use it. And then the executives come in and go, that's really cool. But will it do this, 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 or this? And we're like, no, you're forgetting. This is just a screen. We, that's, you can do whatever you want. And before you know it, what are they doing? They're watching football, right? If they are. <laughs> so, so what happens is, is we've done a great job of getting the tech here and maybe some of these conference spaces and big events. But guess what? What if any sales call, every sales call, every meeting in any room requires this tech? Right? So that's a game changer from that perspective. So my whole goal is, is to try and find use cases that move us down the opportunity scale and move us down the value chain into a much broader opportunity. So if you are differentiating yourself in your product outgoing, your discovery demos, if you are able to go ahead and bring people together where customers and partners feel like they're in the same room, question is, is how much suddenly would you pay for that? How much is that worth? And if you used it every single day because it's part of your workflow, how much is that worth? And those are the type of things that I and my team have been exploring for the last few years. And what we realized is the biggest opportunity is right here. How many webinars? Now that we're a connected society that's becoming hybrid, what can we do for every product offering, webinar, customer discovery, sales demo? Because if you make that be worthwhile, then that's a game changer. So for that, the user experience is key. We need to understand the user. We need to understand why they want to use this. And we have to make this as simple as possible. I need you to jump into this product and instantly go, this feels good. Because guess what? When the iPhone landed in our hands, it felt good right? It just worked. It didn't have a whole bunch of things, but it felt good. And that's the magic of any really great product. So these are where I think, based on my 15 years of being in the business, is where it feels good. Number one is latency. The number of times that I have seen touch screens where somebody draws and then a split second later, like what actually happens is latency is this. My pen is here, but my ink is up there. And as I draw, the ink is filling in behind me. Now, what happens in that scenario is your brain actually starts going, hey, you know what? Something is wrong. I feel like I'm going to write slower and slower. Yeah, this doesn't feel good. You know what? I, and they don't even give you a reason. They just go, I don't know, Bob. I don't know, Mary. You know what? It's not for us. They don't even, because they, customers don't understand latency. But latency was one of the biggest things that Steve Jobs focused on on any tech. When you get into a Tesla and you click a button, it just happens, right? If it's out there in the Tesla and you said open door and it spun a circle, it just goes, 
hold on, I'm spinning, I'm figuring it out, I'm figuring it out. Then it opened the door. Guess what? Nobody would buy it. <laughs> right? So, and one of the measures of latency, especially in audio video systems that go into boardrooms, to me, is you have to get to about 60 frames per second minimum and a 10 millisecond goal. That means that every action that I do has to pop up within 10 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds is the, I, the time it takes for you to blink. But guess what? Actually, your blink, you might think, is really fast. It's actually very slow. Uh, from a human cognitive and how we interact, blinks are actually quite slow. So you want to make this be, and this is the next one, pen detection. If you cannot pick up a pen and write, pick up an eraser and erase, your users will not get it. Oh, hold on. What, what did you say? I have to click this. I have to click this. Click that. Click this and draw. Oh, no, there we go. We draw. Now I want to erase it. Click here. Click here. And oh, got it. Yeah, nobody's going to. It's, it's, it's over at that point. It's over. <laughs> it's over at that point. Right. I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, it, that's that's the that's the, the they like you said, they may not be able to verbalize that. But once that once that pain is induced from that experience, it's over. It's over. Right. And what happens is, is uh, they, they basically come back and classic example. Can I just get a projector? Can, can I just get a cable and plug in my laptop? And all of us integrators sit there with our hearts broken going, oh my God, I can't believe you just asked me. Or, e or even worse, a, a little, uh, <laughs> a, a, a whiteboard, a, a white paper, yeah. <laughs> a flipboard. You know? Which, give me the paper. I, exactly, give me the paper. Coming, uh, what did I do here? Oh yeah, that's right, I did screw this up. <laughs> Coming back to that, which is, and we forget about this, the natural, user experience of someone picking up a pen and just writing something. You know, the funniest thing is, is even some of those whiteboards, you know, you see these James Bond movies where there's millions of equations and all sorts of stuff on a whiteboard. Actually, that's not how most people work. It's really funny. You go to the biggest boardrooms and there's a whiteboard that just says this. And that's what the entire meeting was about. <laughs> so, People come up and go, yeah, you know what? We have 13 million whiteboard samples and templates. It's, it's really hilarious. Um, somebody came up re you know, a little while ago at a trade show and they said, ah, does Reactive, this system, does it have templates? And I go, templates like what? They said, well, the, we saw a different technology that had templates for things like SWOT analysis. I said, really, SWOT analysis? You got a template. <laughs> It's two lines. You don't need a template. Nobody's going to click on a button to go. By the way, how many times a, a year do you do SWOT? Oh, at least once a year, we go into a SWOT analysis. And uh, yeah, the, the other vendor had a template. I go, but for once a year, for two lines, like seriously, that, that's your SWOT. Why would you need a template and more buttons, right? Like as soon as you go down that type of path, immediately people go, okay, this is too complicated. I have to remember a year later, I have to click a button to go to a template and pick across so I can put it up on my whiteboard so I can write. So it's really interesting as to how people think along that. And the last step for me is reliability. Okay, so if it doesn't work as advertised, it will never actually get it off the gate. So the technology that we're talking about here, I just wanna let you know is we actually have ShadowSense designed into military fighter aircraft. This is a British aerospace Hawk fighter. This entire thing is a primary avionic surface that's actually a touchscreen. And this is a supersonic jet, jet fighter that you can imagine the EMI fails, the shake and wipe that it goes through because if that touchscreen fails, uh, a $400 million piece of equipment <laughs> actually cannot land because everything is through there. So we work with partners like L3 Harris, and this is a ShadowSense touchscreen right there. Um, so when you ask about reliability, uh, we talk about the fact that the Joint Strike Forces fighter, the F-22 Raptor, together with the British Aerospace Hawk, including 737s, actually use off-the-shelf ShadowSense technology in order to get to reliability. So if your use case is more stringent than that, I don't know if we can help you, but all the way through to a supersonic jet fighter that's using us as a primary avionics controller, we can actually get you all of this type of stuff. Because guess what? That latency is pretty important for that user when, they have, uh, when they're actually controlling that uh, in a 6G turn and it continues to work. Now, the interesting thing is, is now that you have all of this, 
set up. You've got great user experience. What is the objective? Let's talk about the specific objective as how I have it over here. Now I talked about webinars and I talked about sales meetings, but how does that translate to real life? So the funny thing is, is a lot of times people give interactive technology with a camera right there on top of the board. And most people stop using it because you know why? Hey, I turned that camera on and all I see is the top of my head all the time. That's not particularly the most flattering way you're gonna go ahead and get users, but these are the simple things that nobody has actually addressed. People stop using interactive technologies. I've actually seen boardrooms, this is hilarious. And I'm, I'm sure you have too. Because people are sitting at a table, they put the interactive technology with a camera here so that it's eye level to people sitting. And I always wonder, so the individual that's standing in front of the board, you've got the crotch shot, like how does that work, right? How many times does anybody use that? Oh, none of us use it, none of us turn the camera on because nobody can go up to the board while the camera's on. But hold on, that you just installed this, all this technology. You just told me that nobody goes up to the board if the camera's on, how does that work? <laughs> it's hilarious the number of type of things that we've actually seen in, in my, in my uh, uh, career. So what I'm actually going to show you here is what I believe is the ideal setup. What I have over here is not only do I have my interactive touch technology over here, but I have an audience monitor right there. So I can see all my webinar attendees and the chat channels. And I actually, anybody who's turned their camera on and that we elevated, we can actually see over here. So the intention here is not only am I interacting with you, I can make you feel like you're in the same room. I've invited you, I'm standing in front of the board, which means that my energy changes. If I'm in a boardroom, I wanna get utilization. I wanna make people feel good to use the AV equipment in the boardroom. Now, how do you do that? It has to be based on, you know, it fundamentally changing my posture, my energy. Because this is the reason that I wanna come in during pandemic to my board and my AV equipment, and I don't wanna sit there in front of my desk. So that's the transition. If you do that, you set the camera over here, that's the presenter camera, but at the same time, we also have the ability to set, oops, sorry, wrong device over here, a room camera. So I can actually have audience participation from the room interacting with people in front of the board, talking to the remote individuals. So across the board, you can integrate in all of these devices and suddenly the digital technology becomes part of the hub. It's doing, now, if you didn't have this type of setup, you'd actually getting muxes, video source mixers, all sorts of things have to be integrated in to overlay all of these video images together. But the ability for this to be as interactive using the touch, pick up a pen and interact, stand in front of that board, suddenly has massive value for the tens of thousands of dollars of AV equipment that's actually being installed. So part of that is teaching customers and teaching people the value of this by doing this type of a demonstration. So hopefully you all feel like you're actually watching me in my boardroom that I've invited you into. And how many webinars have you been to that the presenters were able to integrate you into that that easily, right? So that's the real trick. Now coming into it, there's a whole bunch of software strategies that you actually have to go ahead and consider as well. And obviously I'm gonna show you what I'm doing here in order to drive this. But if you're talking about a big technology company and we can transform the way that they're integrating webinars and do live events right from any location, What's that worth, right? How often would that be utilized? So what's the software strategies? Number one, people don't understand how to use a deck. So what happens over and over again is video conference tools either say, you're completely in the deck and my executive presence is completely gone, or they tell you to pick. My deck is really gone and I am now completely into the camera, right? So you don't have the opportunity to mix both of them together. 
And I have a lot of webinars on the neuroscience of learning how we engage each other in a remote world. And what actually happens is the deck itself is only about 7% of the value of this particular technology. And you as an individual is super important in how you interact, which leads us to the next thing is controlling our audience's focus. So in most webinars and most interactive technologies being used with a PowerPoint, I could be talking about this point, but your eye is over here. I have no way of controlling your focus. See, when I go to a classroom, and even in the world's largest universities, people will write down formulas and, you know, you're going to go ahead and talk it over because there's a lot of value for writing things down. It's called reinforcement learning. It's me controlling your attention. I want you to be visual. So when I circle it, I write it, you read it, you hear it, it becomes far more important. Your brain immediately goes, oh, look, I have to pay attention over there. So there's a whole art of why do you ink and mark up. Use your deck as a visual aid where I am prominent, I am making you feel like you're talking to an individual, but at the same time, I'm directing your attention towards the key aspects. Now, if this is done in a boardroom with an earnings call, investor relations, town hall meetings, you know, where the CEO feels like I'm standing in front of my entire team and I am now in control of the situation, that's a very powerful uh, ability for technology to go ahead and transform and bring situational awareness to the presentation. We talk about situational awareness. Pilots talk about that. You know, drivers, if you're learning driving, what's the first thing we teach our kids, right? Like be aware of what's going on around you. Be situationally aware. We get to the point where we're checking our blind spot like automatically every five seconds, but kids don't do that. Same thing with presenters. I always ask, you know, the teams that I coach, what's your blind spot in a presenter? What do you need to be checking? What's your situational awareness and how are you going to go get there? And the ultimate thing is, is for us to actually convert our presentations into conversations. So interactive technologies that, to recap, that have low latencies, high power performance, great writing ability, together with a great software strategy and the display that improves utilization, especially in a sales, marketing, town hall, regular meetup, drive enormous amount of value, but they also drive utilization, which means that when you have conversations that are interactive and you're engaging an audience, they actually get you ROI. So I'd love to open up and ask some of, the, uh, some of our viewers what type of questions you might actually have. Put it up in chat, um, or if you're on camera, go ahead and unmute and go ahead and ask. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Hey, have I got a question? Uh, sure. This is Dave Merlino. You, you, you went over all the different technologies. I really appreciate that. I was unaware that the IR interface is susceptible to challenges with, with high ambient light. I, I, I would think your technology would also be susceptible to that. Oh, you know uh, what? Fantastic. You did not mention that. Good. We're not. We're completely immune. You saw that aircraft flying at 40,000 feet? Okay. Um, thank you for asking. Uh, I'll explain how this works. So in a normal IR system, they actually use something, I'm gonna be a little technical here. They use something called a transistor, okay? And the transistor either turns on or off, okay? So when the LED light is sh showing light through here, the transistor is on. When I block this with my finger, the transistor is off. But if I take a flashlight and put light in, the transistor turns back on and that's the problem that you have. Okay, you would think in shadow sense you have the exact same problem. And actually we have a very unique way of solving this. We have our shadow sensors right at the top, then we have our LED. And absolutely, when the finger is blocked, the transistor, the, the, our sensor is also not able to go ahead and it also picks up the ambient light. How do we solve it? Well, this is part of our patent. We actually, go ahead and do something called we modulate the light. So let me give you an example. When you tune your radio to 99.9 .9 megahertz, I don't care how close you are to that radio station or not, I don't pick up 102.1, I don't pick up 102.5.
So this is called the carrier wave. When you have 99 point megahertz, our radio is tuning to that carrier wave and we completely ignore everything else. So in shadow sense, we have an eight megahertz carrier wave that the LEDs are tuned to. And because of that, these sensors are actually, we've got a tuner circuit that only is tuned to this. So all the sunlight in the world disappears. Now, the next question is, ah, why can't everybody else do that? Okay, I'm sure you're wondering it, but if you go back to your IR beam break, maybe I have a hundred beams by a hundred beams, okay? That means that I have a thousand, or sorry, 10,000 uh, receivers. Every one of them needs a tuner. If a tuner is even $1, this would be ridiculously expensive. But in shadow sense, we only have four or six or eight sensors on the top picking up the shadows. So we could easily afford to put dollars into the tuner that the IR system cannot. Makes total sense, makes total sense. So it doesn't matter the size of the display, uh, you, you're gonna use four or six maximum. Um, so uh, we actually use more because when you have a huge display, that sensor might not be able to pick up the LEDs from here. So we might go, there's six for this zone here. There's six for this zone here. The, the algorithm automatically zones all the sensors to optimize visibility. So in a large system, we do have more sensors because we don't, again, there's only so much power that the LEDs give you, right? So if you put too much power, then they burn out, you have a whole bunch of other problems. So what we do is we definitely overload sensors, but in a large, larger systems, we can also afford to put in more sensors because of the fact that the systems are also more expensive. But all the way through to 98 inches, we only have uh, six. Some of our smallest products, like 15 inches, only have four. But we try to stick between six to eight sensors as much as possible. And beyond 98, that's when we go to 12 and 16 and 18, based on how large the walls are and how much light that we're getting in. And so you have, no set, you have no sensors on the, on the vertical, only no. on the horizontal? That's right. All okay. of our sensors are coming back to the shadow sense thing. They're only along the top and they're not along the bottom. That's correct. So we have LEDs all the way, right. So coming back to this, we have shadow sensors along the top and LEDs in all three directions over here. Okay. So sensors on the top, but you need the bezel on all four sides. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Well, so that is the bezel. Yeah. And yeah, now you're seeing how the nonlinear this conversation is. The ability for me to pick up and diagram. This is exactly the type of a sales call you would want to have with your customers. Let me pull up that information. Let me architect this for you right now. Let me show you my stru the structure of how this works versus that works. And that's what I want interactive technologies to be capable of. It's really, uh, congratulations. It's, it, it, it's really sharp. It, it's um, impressive. And everything you've done today, you know, I haven't noticed any latency whatsoever. And it looks super easy to use. And like you said, very, um, very useful indeed and educational. So congrats. Thanks for, thanks oh, for having us. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to working with you guys. And at the end of it is if you can package this up into that type of a use case, that's where I think the market will absolutely explode because I now want to look damn good in front of that damn good display. And I want to do a killer job because if I do that, everybody will notice and the list goes on and on and on, right? So that's exactly the type of things that we would want to go ahead and accomplish. And we're uh, we're up against almost the hour here, so I just uh, uh, just wanted to say hey to uh, those on the call and those are out in social media uh, connections. Uh, this is Jamie Finnegan from Media Resources. So we'll follow, we'll do a follow up. Uh, we're going to do a webinar uh, uh, sometime next month uh, in tandem with Av and his team to uh, show the benefits of using touch technology across uh, DV LED. As many of you know, uh, up until recently, uh, if you were going to try and apply touch interactivity to a direct view LED wall. You had to basically run for the hills, screaming and running and, and pretending like you didn't hear it with your fingers, your fingers in your ears. So acting like you didn't hear the mask for that. 
Well, that no longer has to be the case. So we've got some technology that's uh, applied to our uh, direct view LED surface that ruggedizes the surface so that it can be cleaned uh, and sanitized and also have touch interactivity added to it very easily. So um, that's something that we wanted to spend a few minutes uh, on our next session talking about and giving you guys some more. And, and our, it is our intent to show it actually in action so that Av would be doing the same thing, but on, a, uh, on an LED wall. So st stay tuned for more of that and uh, we'll be back in touch. Thanks. Thanks again. Any other comments, questions? I hope you had a memorable one hour. I hope you had a fantastic experience. And this is exactly what I want teams everywhere to be captured because suddenly then this has value. Appreciate that again. Very Thank you, Av. Appreciate it. Thanks for the Thanks, time. Uh, great job. Everybody. And we will have this on display at Infocom, by the way. Anybody out there, this will be on display at Infocom at our booth. So more to come. Absolutely. Thanks, and we'll guys. run Thank webinars there, buddy. And we'll, you and me will run webinars. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye.